appreciate your presence tonight. Enjoyed a good lesson from James Arline. If you have the opportunity, you may want to listen to that again. <clears throat> uh, we're currently in the study of Romans, getting towards the end of it. <clears throat> we left off at uh, second verse of chapter 15 last time, so we'll start with the third verse uh, this time. <clears throat> Before we do, though, let's have a short word of prayer. Blessed Heavenly Father, we are thankful we come before Thee at this time in the study of Thy Word, recognizing the power that it has to deliver us from evil, that we might enjoy the salvation to come. We pray our study may be fruitful, that we may become more knowledgeable of Thy Word, that we may, may become more useful in the kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, whose name we pray. Amen. It reads in uh, verse uh, 3 of chapter 15, For even Christ did not please himself, <clears throat> but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproach you fell on me. And that comes from the uh, 69th Psalm, verse 9 of that Psalm. And that's a, that's a Psalm of David, just keep that in mind. <clears throat> so uh, why should we please our neighbor? Well, we have the example of Christ that while in the flesh, he did not seek to please himself alone, but sought the good of others. As I said, the uh, 69th Psalm is a Psalm of David. The uh, quotation there is, then is about David. He suffered uh, reproaches from men that were aimed at God. As is often the case, quotations can have double application. What originally referred to David also refers to the Christ. He suffered reproach in his day. They were aimed at the Father. Since men could not get at the Father, they went after the Son in the flesh. He came to save men from their sins and suffered every unpleasantry, even death, on the cross to achieve that end. The unbelieving Jew would never admit that he hated the Father. <clears throat> but as Jesus said, as recorded in John 15th chapter, verses 23 and 24, he who hates me hates my Father also. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would have no sin. But now they have seen and also hated both me and my Father. Their hatred of the Christ alienated them from the Father. <clears throat> In verse 4, for whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through the patience and the comfort of the scriptures might have hope. If you look at the Greek, it really should, uh, it's not we through the patience of the scriptures, but we through patience and the comfort of the scriptures might have the hope. Uh, the scriptures here refers to the Old Testament since the new was in the process of being revealed through the agency of the apostles and other New Testament writers. There are many examples in the Old Testament uh, you know, if you recall our, our study of Hebrews, 11th chapter in particular, many examples in the Old Testament that showed the blessings that came to the obedient servants of God through their self-denial and patient suffering for the honor of God and the good of man. The Old Testament reveals how God deals with men, how he views sin, and how men of faith are rewarded. 
its dealings with the men of old are instructive to us in how to perform our duty to him and how God will regard such performance or failure to perform. <clears throat> God's treatment of the, and the treatment of the unfaithful are just as much for our good as is his treatment of the faithful. We need both the warning against evil and the encouragement to do good. In the Greek, the word the, quote unquote, appears before patience, comfort, and hope. Although it is in the Greek, the word is not included in the translated text of the Nestle-Land uh, translation or the Texas Receptus lexicons. The King James and the ASV versions do not include the word the, but the New King James has it modifying the word patience. In such instance, it uh, seems to me that the New King James is incorrect. The patient, patience consists in bearing kindly the scruples of the weak. The comfort and the consolation arising from the sense of doing right and the hope, quote unquote, of future glorification that enables us to patiently endure present trials. All of these are characteristics of the worthies of old. In verse 5, now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded towards one another according to Christ Jesus. We are to be of the same mind of those alluded to in the previous verse, that is, the mind that is ready to please others for their good. Patient, patience and comfort are derived from God. He has demonstrated extreme long suffering towards mankind, not willing that any should perish, Second Peter three verse nine. That is abundantly evident in his dealing with the, his rights. Israel and Judah. Paul S. elsewhere wrote, Fulfill my joy by being like minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Philippians, the second chapter, verses 2 through 5. The wording according to Christ Jesus may mean either after the example of Christ or according to his will. Either example or command would be correct since both arrive at the same place. <clears throat> in verse 6, it's a continuation of verse 5, <clears throat> that you may with one mind in one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That the strong and the weak may uh, with one mind, that is unanimity of sentiment and feeling, and with one mouth, that is, unanimity of voice, praise and worship God, all to glorify Him. Mind and mouth denote perfect union of the strong and weak. Verse 7, therefore receive one another, just as Christ also received us, to the glory of God. The appeal is to the strong and the weak, but it cannot be limited to these. It also applies to Jews and Gentiles. It excludes separation or division on matters of indifference. Christ appealed to all despite their infirmities, ethnicity, or other temporal differences, 
and receive them solely on the basis of their obedience. In like manner, we should receive all others. The compassionate welcome that Christ gave to all who are obedient to his gospel ought to be duplicated, which we give to the same obedient ones. If there are some concessions to make, some antipathy to surmount, some injury to forgive, the thought that we are thereby laboring for the glory of God through the grace of Jesus Christ ought to lift us above such trivial annoyances. In verse 8, <clears throat> now say that Jesus Christ has become a servant, or, or the King James and ASB as minister, has become a servant to the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made to the fathers. The circumcision, quote, unquote, refers to the Jews. Christ was the seed of Abraham and fulfilled the covenant of the old law. As Jesus said, quote, unquote, for assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law until till all is fulfilled. That comes from the 18th verse of Matthew chapter 5. <clears throat> Jesus was born under the law and served under it and fulfilled it in order that he might redeem those under the law. Paul wrote, but when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Galatians, the fourth chapter, verses four through five. <clears throat> the truth of God is contained in the promises made to the fathers, and by those promises and the fulfillment thereof, its truthfulness is declared and maintained. His truthfulness must be maintained because of his character and his desire to save mankind. Christ became a servant to the circumcision to confirm or to prove the promises of God made to the fathers. As the writer of Hebrew epistle put it, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from uh, which they had come out of, they would have had opportunity to return. <clears throat> but now they desire better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to call their God, for he has, called, he has prepared a city for them. That's from the 11th chapter of Hebrews, verses 13 through 16. <clears throat> and verse 9 is a continuation of verse 8. And that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. That is, that is as it is written, for this reason, uh, ASB has therefore, and King James Version has for this cause. For this reason, I will confess to you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. <clears throat> Christ became a servant, uh, that is, a minister to the Jews for the sake of God's truthfulness. Not that the Jews alone might be saved, but the Gentiles also, for the promises included both. Therefore, the Gentiles would have reason to glorify God because they had access to salvation, as did the Jews. <clears throat> Since Christ accepted the Gentiles on the same basis as he accepted the Jews, both are under the injunction of verse 7 to, quote, unquote, receive one another, even as Christ received you. The mercy of God provided for the salvation of the Jew as well as the Gentile. 
quotation is from Psalms, the 18th of the 18th Psalm, verse 49. <clears throat> and it reads there, Therefore I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the Gentiles, and sing praises to your name. <clears throat> So what was the reason that's in this uh, verse <clears throat> for this reason? It was because both Jews and Gentiles were to be accepted by Christ on the same basis and could therefore uh, compose on united and happy people. David, a Jew, was portrayed as being among the Gentiles, confessing God and singing to his name along with the Gentiles. There would be a mutually acceptance of each other so completely that each would rec recognize the same God and obey the same gospel. Therefore, we are to receive one another, quote unquote, just as Christ also received us to the glory of God. <clears throat> Verse 10 is, and again he says, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. In the previous verse, David represents himself as singing to God among the Gentiles. <clears throat> In the citation taken from Deuteronomy, the 32nd chapter, verse 43, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. For he will avenge the blood of his servants and render vengeance to his adversaries. He will provide atonement for his name and his people. So, from that citation, the Gentiles are represented as being glad among the Jews. The design of both passages is to promote mutual acceptance. <clears throat> Verse 11, and again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Laud him, all ye peoples. And that comes from the 117th Psalm, verse 1. Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Laud him, all ye peoples. <clears throat> all the Gentiles should praise the Lord and laud him because he has accepted them into his grace. This is conclusive proof that all nations were to share in the redemption offered through the Christ. Since Christ has accepted all, do you. In verse 12, and again, Isaiah says, There shall be a root of Jesse, and he who shall rise to reign over the Gentiles. In him the Gentiles shall hope. <clears throat> and the exact reading of uh, in Isaiah is from 11, chapter verse 10. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, who shall stand as a banner to the people. For the Gentiles shall seek him, and his resting place shall be glorious. This proof is provided by the prophet Isaiah, the quote-unquote root of Jesse, is Christ. Not only will this root of Jesse rise up to rule over the Jews, he will rise up to reign over the Gentiles as well. The Gentiles shall trust him for salvation as would the Jew. Christ was to be the uh, be Lord over and Savior to the Jew as fully to the Gentile. <clears throat> In verse 13, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. A hope is a reference to the future. <clears throat> Isaiah said, In him the Gentile shall hope. Paul wrote in Ephesians, the second chapter, verse 12, respecting the Gentiles, quote unquote, that at, at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world, close quote. <clears throat> without this hope, there could be no joy or peace. 
with it one could not be without them. We are filled with joy and peace and believing. That is a, an active, continuous, continuous believing, which belief is evidenced by obedience and consequently abounds in hope. In this age of miracles, New Testament times, these disciples abounded in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Today, we may abound in hope by the word of the gospel, God's power to save, revealed by the power of the Holy Spirit. But what is it that we're hoping for? Our hope is laid up in heaven, and it is there that it awaits us. Colossians, the first chapter, verse 5 says, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. Salvation is a process by which we may attain the hope which is laid up for us in heaven. First Thessalonians, the fifth chapter, verse 8 says, but let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Salvation is eternal life. A life of glorification, joy, and peace promised by God before time began. Titus, the first chapter, verse 2 reads, In hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. Titus 3, verse 7 says that, Having been justified, justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Ever since the time of Christ and under all circumstances, eternal life has been the compelling hope of the Christian. In verse 14 reads, Now I myself am confident concerning you, my brethren, that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. <clears throat> At the time of this writing, Paul had not been to Rome. So it may be that he has received news of the conditions in Rome that gave rise to confidence in the brethren there. Based on such presumed reports, he is confident that they are, that, that they are good people and filled with all knowledge. He cannot mean to say that every individual is filled with all knowledge or else he would not have touched on the subject covered in chapter 14. But in the aggregate, the church in Rome possessed all knowledge respecting the topic addressed. It would be the knowledge essential to the highest form of Christian life and to salvation. He has not addressed them as he has because they are ignorant but because of the advanced state of their knowledge. Nor has, has he admonished them because he supposed them incapable of admonishing one another. But he has been bold for reasons soon to be disclosed. Verse 15, he says, Nevertheless, brethren, I have written more boldly to you on some points. And King James says in some sort, ASB says, in some measure, I've written to you more boldly on, you, on some points as reminding you because of the grace given to me by God. The, the Greek word translated in the New King James as, quote unquote, on, on some points, has the idea of covering a subject in part, but not fully. Paul seems to be saying that uh, he has written to them more boldly, but not everywhere in his letter, but only in part, that he is here and there in certain places. He is reminding them regarding the points he has addressed, not because they don't know them, but to bring it to the forefront of their remembrance. 
the Apostle Peter did the same in his, his address to his readers in Second Peter, first chapter, verse 12, which reads, For this reason I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. Paul is therefore writing them to recall to their memory those things that they had already learned. He can write them more boldly because of the grace given to him by God. The grace was given to him. The grace given to him was his apostolic office. In verse 16, he says that I might be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, still continuing the same thought, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. The favor was bestowed on Paul in order that he might be an apostle of Christ. A minister would be equivalent to apostle. He was a minister to the Gentiles, appointed a minister for their benefit and devoted to their service. Only Paul was appointed a minister to the Gentiles. That is, he was the apostle to the Gentiles. That was his domain. And, of course, it was vast. No wonder that he labored more abundantly than all the other apostles. He was to declare to the Gentiles the gospel of God that in their obedience to it that he might be offered up to God acceptable, that they may be offered up to God acceptable in his sight and sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Jesus implored the God the Father to sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. John 17 verse 17. In verse 17, he says, Therefore, I have reason to glory in Christ Jesus in the things which pertain to God. His reason would, would be that he was an apostle and in the things he had accomplished as an apostle to the Gentiles. Paul could say to the Romans what he said to the Corinthians. For I determined not to know anything among you, among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. 1 Corinthians, the second chapter, verse uh, 2. And to the Galatians, but God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. That's uh, from sixth chapter of Galatians, verse 4. In verse 18, for I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me. In word and deed, to make the Gentiles obedient. In consequence of what Paul was and had done, Paul was enabled to boast in Christ in matters relating to God. But in so doing, he would not mention one thing that Christ had not brought about through him and him alone. He would confine himself strictly to his own work. The purpose of Paul, Paul's toils was to bring the message of the gospel to, to the Gentiles in order that they might be saved. In verse 9, I see we're at the end of the uh, bottom of the half hour so we'll stop here and we'll begin with verse 9 probably begin with verse 18 again since that's one thought with verse 19 we'll we'll begin that uh, next week thank you